to try something a little different to open today's show. John Carroll, take it away. Once again, I'm stepping up to the plate. Strike one. Can't remember what I had to do today. Right on. Think I'm making iced tea and ponder what's in it for me. I wonder. Yeah. On the front porch, nobody knows you're a little down. On the front porch, sitting counting the cars heading into town. Yeah, that's John Carroll on the front porch. And you can go get that song at johncarroll.org. He played that for us live at the Hangout last week, and it was amazing. I love his music, and I love him. And he showed up in the shed last Thursday night. Who knows what's going to happen Tonight, it's Thursday, and we will be hanging out tonight at 8 p.m. East. I hope to see you there. If you're a stand-up subscriber, come on over. It's virtual. It's awesome. We have a great time. Last week, I had John as a special surprise guest and some big news that I decided I would be running for town council. So today on the show, I wanted to break some more big news, ladies and gentlemen. I decided... To end my campaign for town council. Yep. For reals. That's right. I feel like a real idiot. Egg on my face. What was I thinking? (laughs) There's a lot of that today. Long story, really. And I wanted to share with you here at the top. It's super personal. I have shared a lot with folks because... Listeners have told me over the years when I'm honest and when I'm vulnerable and when I talk about my own shortcomings, weaknesses, or in this case, indecisiveness or really humiliations, mistakes that other people feel less alone. They feel more human and seen. I always feel that way when you share your issues and struggles and joy, all of it with me. And so that's why I wanted to talk just a little bit about it here at the top and then We will get to my conversation with the great Wajahad Ali on today's show. But yeah, I've been having problems at home. Val and I have been having problems. I convinced her that I needed her support. I got her support. And then we just had one concern after another and arguments. And we just couldn't see eye to eye on it. And then I realized for myself that it was just so much work. And I... Wasn't sure I had the energy or that I could handle the stress of it all and also do what I love best, which is invest a lot of my life and time into this daily podcast. I'm so damn proud of what we have created here with Stand Up with Pete Dominic, the stand up community and the everyday enlightenment that we get from our guests and each other. I, 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 I'm just too scared. I'm too scared to allow it to maybe wither. I tried to convince you and myself that I'd be able to do it all, but I, I can't, I've been here before. You've heard me talk this way before last year when I had to drop the news segment from the show. Cause I was doing too much. You see a lot of folks out there who are independent journalists and creators going through this. You think you can handle it. You think you can keep up with that kind of output day after day. And then you realize you burn out. We've seen amazing talents like Emily Atkin and so many others be really vulnerable and honest about that. Obviously a lot, lots of artists, lots of other people as well. And that is exactly what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to say it was going to be too much. My wife wasn't fully on board. The girls weren't really either. And I was too worried about letting the podcast in any way become anything less than it is when really what I need to do is invest more ideas into it and be more creative and listen to more of your ideas and suggestions and let it take its course the way it always has. And I was scared. I was definitely scared. I have said 
hundreds of thousands of times into cameras on television and radio and everywhere else. Things I've said, things, things that I stand by. I mean, my conscience is clear, but you could take anything that I believe and use it against me in a campaign for town council. And was that all going to be worth it? I really was so excited. And I had so many amazing people here in my town behind me. And so, and so many of you really were inspiring and supportive. And so I feel like I've let everybody down. I feel like a lot of people wasted their time on me and faith in me. And so that sucks. I'll get over it. It wasn't weeks of people's time. Nobody spent money. I didn't knock on one door or take one donation, but still there were hours and hours that several people spent working on this and just me talking about it. I hope that if you can take anything from it, it's that there are times in your life where you have to make tough decisions about your future, about your finances, about your time, your job, your relationships. And for me, I had to do what I think was best for my family, for Val and I, because we've been doing so well for so long. And I felt that starting to fray and for my work, which I love so much here. So that's it. I appreciate whatever kindness you're sending my way. And I'm sure plenty of you will reach out with that. I'll talk a little bit more about it at the hangout, but yeah, sorry to have once again, pulled the Pete Dominic over promise under deliver. I feel like that's a, a thing I do from time to time. And I feel yeah, I need to work on that. I need to work on that as we all do. So I will continue on forward with this work that I am doing here on the show and hopes that you will continue to appreciate it and take something beneficial from it and support it. I also want to, I still want to make more of an effort to have conversations that are more enlightening about how to navigate life in general and maybe less conversations about current events and politics, though I love doing that and I'm never going to stop doing that. I think it's important and responsible to understand what's happening in the world and I don't want to be apathetic myself and I want to be the change that I want to see in the world and I want to be purpose driven and do good work that you can support and appreciate. And that is the plan. And that has been the plan. And so in the future, I hope to take this show on the road, come see you. I hope to continue doing it and allow it to evolve in all of the ways that it can. And I'm so, so happy to have you along for the journey. So what do you say? Shall we get to it? The stand-up universe, the stand-up community uh, is global and gets people jobs. And I was in Houston over the weekend. And if that gentleman who was there is listening, this guy came to hear me and Mehdi Hassan speak because he was, uh, Mehdi was promoting his book. uh, The uh, Yeah, I uh, want you to introduce me to him too. Uh, We we tweet Uh, each other, but I would. Win every argument. And this guy came and he's like, yeah, I listened to uh, Pete's show. And I listen to you and Pete, and it's fantastic. And I'm the perfect demographic. I'm a dude in my 40s, and I feel like you guys are speaking my language. So I thought it was amazing that someone who recognized me from the stand-up Pete Dominic show came out Love to it. an event in Houston. I don't know who that is, but I, I, I'm i going to find out. They'll they'll out themselves. It's a brown dude. Brown guy. Brown guy in his 40s. So hmm. y- you reach out to – you are the one that can heal the nation. <laughs> I'm very proud of the diversity of the audience. I like to think that uh, people of color appreciate the way this white guy talks about and is genuinely curious about issues that affect all of us, especially people who aren't me. I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I think they're like this. 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 This could be a good white. Yeah. This could be a white ally. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've proven myself over the last 15 years to be. Once we're in the camps, we can send the pigeons to you, and you can like try. To get us out. That's how I want to die. You know, maybe just give me a halal sandwich before they take you. I wa- <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I did on this earth is smuggle watch halal Philly so, cheese steak. Wait, were you just at South by Southwest? How much time? What's your heart out here? I don't know, like 20 minutes. Okay. I was 20. I wasn't sure. I thought so you were I South- was, I, I, I'm in one of, this is one of those cray months where, uh, I went to Houston. I was in Houston for less than 19 hours. I came back home. I saw my children for like six minutes. Then I went to San Diego, 
where I was there last morning and I addressed like 700 first responders in the morning. It's their annual conference. Very white. Uh, a lot of conservative folks there, some cops, but the people who invited me uh, are from California and they like my politics and they're like, yeah, just shake it up, you know. Uh, but I got like a standing ovation from a third of them. That's nice. Then I left the comfort of San Diego, came back here late last night, saw my kids for 12 more minutes. We'll spend a, a little bit of time with them. And then tomorrow I'm off to Austin for two weeks for South by Southwest. Ah. I finished my interview at South by Southwest. I get on a plane. I go to Qatar. I, I end up in Qatar. I try to sleep for a few hours. I film in Qatar and I come right back. So that's my next two weeks. What are you First doing in Qatar? Where is that? Qatar, Qatar, Qatar. The way they say in Qatar is Qatar. Uh, I, uh, there's something called the Doha debates. I'm not debating, but I'm participating. So they're, they're, they're restarting the Doha debates. And uh, I can't mention the debate, but it's going to be fun. Okay. And then I get to eat a lot, a lot of halal meat. And Qatar Airways is pretty dope. So uh, hopefully I won't break. When you have that back. much travel and you love your kids and being home as much as you do, does do you look at that with like I, uh, when I go when I'm in that situation, I have been in a, in a while, certainly not really before the pandemic. I get real. I don't I get real anxious about it. I usually enjoy all of it, but I, I don't like look forward to it. I don't like leaving my kids at all, man. Right. I, I get very uh, sad. That's why, like, I hug my kids as much as I can. Like, I'm, I'm gone for a day. I like. I was joking with Sarah. This is my look. This is my routine. This is my hotel routine. Wherever I go, I land at the place where I'm at. It's usually red eye flight because I want to maximize time with my kids. I usually get there at the hotel. I Google the same thing I always Google: halal meat near me. I pray to God that there's a halal restaurant close by or something open. I get an Uber. Or I walk. I'm very happy. I bring the food home to my hotel. I get into my hotel, try to FaceTime my kids. My kids see me. Uh, I'm happy. I sit on the bed like a loser and I watch NBA or Sports Center. Then I try to sleep. I can't sleep. So then I just get on the internet and waste time. Then I sleep a couple hours. I get up. I give my talk. I take the next flight out. I come home. I'm exhausted. I play with my kids. There you go. That's my routine. I love that, but I do want to spice it up. I'm going to spice it up. I'm going to figure out a way. I'm going to get you out late at night. You don't drink. You don't really party like that. You go and you sit in, in your in your room, which is fine. You're not a loser at all. It's fine. I don't, don't say that to yourself. But my wife's, my wife's like, you're probably doing these crazy things. I'm like, I order halal food. I sit on the bed. I watch NBA. This is what I, and I miss my kids. I'm going to book something for us. so You and I can like film a documentary. But what are you going to to, uh, to away for two whole weeks from your family, you won't see them for two weeks. Yeah, man, it's gonna be painful. I did Oof. this last year also, right? And then I told my parent, uh, kids, I'm like, uh, please don't forget me. And they're like, whatevs, whatevs, old man, just give me some toys or you're dead to me. Do you and know? Then, what uh, do you know what you're gonna be doing there? I'm hosting South by Southwest Studio. So South right. by Southwest Studio is like this little room in South by, and all these cool people just like roll through. Yep. Uh, and it's kind of like what Pete did at Aspen. And so I get, I got like 70 plus interviews to check out the lineup. It's wild. It's going to be 70 interviews in nine days. It's frigging exhausting, but it's fun. So I got William Shatner. I got Kerry Washington. I got uh, Jen Psaki. I got the guy who like created AI. Uh, I got like, this huge list of really interesting people, Mark Cuban. And then uh, they all get the watch treatment. So hopefully it goes well. Let's see. What is the watch treatment? Is that some kind of restricted dietary, uh, yeah, it's it's lactose free. Uh, it's a full course meal. It, it's uh, it's meat, but no pork, uh, and it's somewhat delightful, but has a sour tang at the end. But nonetheless, <laughs> you, you you don't know if you've uh, had the greatest day of your life or if you've just been mocked. So you're gonna love Shatner. You ever talked? You ever met him? I've never. I've never. I've always heard Shatner. The Pre guy's 91, man. Prepare yourself for his like being really sharply uh, uh, quick witted. He's got his his humor is very, very good. He walked into my studio the first time I ever interviewed him, and he walked in while we were on the air. He's like two minutes late. We'd come back from break, and he just walked in. And he goes, he didn't say hi to me. He didn't know me. He just walked in and goes, I was on the View this morning, and my fly was wide open. That he was. We were live on the air. Go, we're live right now. He goes, I well, everybody needs to know. And that's that's how we that's how we started. He's pretty transparent. He seemed like a very entertaining character. And I, I'm trying to see if I can make truce between him and George Takei. Oh, good. Now he's, now he's talking about death a lot more. I'm like, listen, man, 
between you and Nimoy didn't end well. It seemed like everyone else from that cast didn't really like you. You got one left. Like, can <laughs> you can, can you get along with Takei? Takei does not like him at all, man. No, no. They're never going to. But I do I do hope that you make the effort because it'll be entertaining. bridge the nerd divide, it'd be nice. So, all right. Let's talk. But let's get into it. Lots to get into. First of all, Tucker Carlson, you've had a lot to say about what he is doing with the the video the, he uh, started talking about the 40,000 hours of video that he was given by Kevin McCarthy. Where do you want to start with, with just this? The fact that he even has it is the f- the first problem, it would seem. So we got we got a lot of stuff to talk about over the weekend. There was CPAC, the yeah. annual conservative uh, political uh, conference that used to be the who's who, the Titans. But because of Matt Schlapp, who apparently was slapping around men, Herschel Walker's aides uh, allegedly actors, couldn't resist. I'm a child. I couldn't resist. No, it's important. Uh, it's important. Uh, and so, and Schlapp's a troll. He's trolled me before. And so he hasn't addressed those rumors. Uh, but apparently, you know, uh, the hypocrisy of these people, right? Like shaming and, and intimidating and targeting LGBTQ as they are apparently harassing men, even though he's conservative family values and married to women. Yeah, but George I Santos, too. Uh... Oh, yeah, Jorge Santos, who used to be married to a woman, apparently, but uh, is now with a man and also did drag queen. But he didn't do drag queen because he was just having fun. But I digress. Yeah, but a a recent an aide to his one of his aides accused him. It's pretty, you know, it's a pretty uh, crazy accusation of reaching over and putting his hand on him and asking him out and all stuff. Uh, This is just a couple weeks. Family values. Family values. Pete, same old. Remember Denny Hastert? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, who no one talks about, even though this guy friggin, you know, was a straight up pedophile and yep. was the House GOP speaker. Yep. But I digress. It's all projection. And CPAC was sparsely populated. If you guys haven't seen the clips, hilarious. In the call and response section, there's literally I thought it was an SNL sketch. I thought someone dubbed it. It was like one dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, so at CPAC, you had this <laughs> guy well, and, and they're pretty much indistinguishable, but. I, I get their names confused sometimes. Matt Walsh, uh, Knowles, Ben Shapiro. But he was one of these uh, angry whites from the Daily uh, Wire. And he c- called for the eradication of not transgenders, Pete, but transgenderism. And then he got really angry when people said transgender people. He goes, mm, I'm going to libel you. I'm going to you're libeling me. I'm going to sue you at the same CPAC conference. Uh, I've been told, Pete, that Donald Trump is in the past. He won. The straw poll, 61 percent. Yeah. And today, Donald Trump said that he will be the vengeance and wrath. Right. He will be the what is it? The voice the retribution. I will the be retrib- your retribution. I yeah. will be your retribution. Yeah. Where and do you get, get that on, line? T- on top Kampf? of that fascist, by the way, this is nothing new. They just copy yeah. uh, the language of fascists of the past. And then today and yesterday, Tucker Carlson, who got that 40,000 hours of footage, no one else got it, decides to use his power, white power hour the most influential hour for white supremacists, white nationalists, and the GOP to try to rewrite history, to try to literally rewrite what we all saw with our own eyes. And so that January 6th, as you can clearly see from the five minutes that I've selectively chosen, was peaceful. And as you know, that Tucker Carlson has tried to gaslight all of us and say that January 6th was a false flag. And the right wing has tried his best to uh, run with this false narrative. Uh, even though these violent insurrectionists, Pete, literally videotape themselves committing crimes. And just today, I think about an hour ago, Mitch McConnell called bullshit on it. Some other Republican senators called bullshit on it. But what I'm trying to say is the connecting thread of all of this is the F word. Fascism. This is what fascists do. As Timothy Snyder, whom I think you have interviewed before. Yeah, many the times. expert on fascism has said, post-truth is pre-fascism. They're literally doing in front of us to the point where they're making the base not believe their own eyes. Literally, the violent insurrectionists who are there doing violence, they're like, it wasn't violent. What are you talking about? And thankfully, there is enough sane people, just a few left, Pete. And and a friend of mine who I won't mention, who is in the Biden administration, can't believe they said this, but this is what they said. Mitch McConnell, for all his villainy, is one of the last sober Republicans left. When Mitch McConnell goes, the the Senate leadership will be replaced by freaks like John Cornyn. And just to show you his profile and courage, when he was asked yesterday to condemn Michael Knowles' statement about eradication of transgenderism, guess what he did? Softball down the middle. 
refused to comment on it. Mc, Mc, oh, uh, Cornyn, Cornyn. Of right. Texas. And let's, folks, Mitch McConnell is a supervillain. So when my friend is saying that a supervillain is one of the last sane Republicans left, what do you think is the present and future of the party? And when Donald Trump is talking about retribution and Knowles is talking about eradication and they're gaslighting us about the January 6th violent insurrection, what do you think the end game, end game is, folks? And that's where I want to warn folks. And, and Jay Rosen, I think, has been on your show. Yeah. He's talking about the failure of the media. Last thing I'll say, he says they still haven't learned. They're still failing. And in a tweet, something smart, he said, it isn't horse race politics. The job of the media is to talk about the stakes. What are the stakes that are involved for our democracy? And no one's talking about that. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. No, I appreciate all that. Uh, all, all tying a lot of things together that I definitely want to talk about in, in terms of CPAC, which I used to go to. I've been there a few times, and it's just it's so sparsely. I, I don't know if they sold as many tickets. I don't know what the, the but I mean, like there didn't seem Very to be sparse. There didn't seem to be a lot of energy coming coming out of it, including I didn't see, but not even at Trump's speech there weren't that it wasn't even Nowhere. sold out. No one, really. It was just a weak limp gathering of well, the hardcore MAGA crowd. It couldn't help that uh, Schlapp so publicly schlapped with yeah, those the, the accusations. Schla- they apparently, but this is what's so funny, right? Like, I want to ask you this question. You think about this a lot. You have guests on. So all this was fine. Michael Knowles talking about the eradication of, you know, transgenderism. Not transgender people, but apparently because if you eradicate transgenderism, I, apparently transgender people will he, be perfectly He's fine. trying to split that hair because everybody went after him and said he was inhuman. And he's like, I said transgenderism, not trans. That's How his- dare you call me genocidal? Uh, But across the street, the person who was disinvited from CPAC, Nick Fuentes, the white nationalist leader, who's the head of the Groypers, who met with Donald Trump, who Donald Trump did not uh, throw under the bus, because according to the Guardian article, Donald Trump knows that a part of his base follows Nick Fuentes, so he didn't criticize him. He held a rally. Uh, And in his rally, he just was wide open. With his hatred of the Jews. I watched so that three is, minute video of his. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. You saw that, right? Yeah, I didn't want to share it, but yeah, I saw it. But my question is why did he get disinvited? <laughs> like, doesn't he belong at CPAC? No, because I think once you say, I love Hitler, you don't get to go to CPAC. Oh, yeah. So, like, you have, you can only go half Hitler. You can never go full Hitler. Well, you could be a fascist. You could say you're a fascist, you're pro-fascism. But on the way into the Gaylord Hotel, they're like, do you, do you denounce Hitler? And you have to say yes. And if you say, if you say no, then they send you across the street. Like, well, there's, you can go over and hang out with Nick Fuentes is having a thing. Yeah. yeah. And literally Nick Fuentes, and we've been saying this on your show for years, right? And people kind of laughed at us, dis- dismissed us. I said, white supremacy and white nationalist talking points will go mainstream by 2024. I was wrong. It's 2023. It's literally adjacent, literally adjacent to the mainstream GOP. What's right across from CPAC? Nick Fuentes. Yeah. The guy whose conference was attended by Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar, who now have been awarded by Kevin McCarthy, the spineless amoeba of a man, with membership in the House Oversight Committee. This is where we are, man. I'm trying to connect the dots for your listeners, just so you all know where the stakes are. And I know I've heard this before, right? That me and Danielle were just talking about this on, on our podcast, Democracy Ish. I just want to be blunt. You know, when it comes with the T, they always go after the lowest hanging fruit. So Trump, seven years ago, who do you go after first? undocumented immigrants. I was trying to sound the alarm. I'm like, he's going to go after blacks next. He's going to be Jews. It's going to be women, right? Then he went after Muslims. People didn't care that much. Then he goes after blacks and Jews and journalists, right? T is the Trojan horse. They just won't stop at T, Pete. T is the Trojan horse of the CRT, right? CRT was what? First, the black books, black history. And then they said, oh, wow, you know, some people are against this. But you know what they're also trying to do? They're trying to teach your kids to hate white people and hate U.S. history, but yeah. they're also turning your kids into T's. The T's stuck because the T terrified a lot of suburban voters and centrist Democrats. So they're like, aha, this is our win. So under the, the hatred of the T's, they're going to Trojan horse everything else. And people honestly think, Pete, a lot of folks, a lot of people of color, a lot of religious communities, a lot of Democrats, they're like, oh, go after the T's. It'll stop at the T's. It ain't going to stop at the the T is transgen is trans people, trans folks. Yeah, I just want to be clear. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, I I think that's pretty, pretty dead on. I mean, what I think that you're seeing a lot of that strategy very out in the open in Florida. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're watching Uh, DeSantis. DeSantis. 
the full fascist playbook of uh, Florida and Texas. Can I tell you something? Which is, I was in Texas in Houston. We had this, uh, you know, it was like 170 people, right? And in the Q and A, it was pretty much all these folks living in Texas, all talked about gun control, and they're like, "We're terrified." There's this teacher, a black Muslim woman, who said, "Let me just tell you what happened two days ago. There was a shooting drill, an active shooter on campus. I was thinking about protecting my life, and I was thinking about how can I protect these 35 kids, and I was thinking about how." What should I do? And then I was thinking about, it's not my job to do this, but I'll give my life for these kids. Mm. And I'm like, why do we live with this madness? And so everyone was asking maybe, how do we literally reframe the debate? And why don't we have gun control? And why do we have to live like this? And you look at two states, which are the laboratory of the fascist utopia that Republicans want to create. Yeah. Florida and Texas. Yeah. Banning books, punishing Disney, don't say gay, taking away women's rights going to go after the abortion pill this is where america will be if they get power and norm ornstein on mary's show earlier today i mean he used florida as an example he said listen they're trying to secede (laughs) in real time like this is their secession in real time florida texas like this is their plot this is where they want to go jackson mississippi jackson mississippi where they're literally rewriting the laws because they're like ah these blacks they're passing laws we don't like Fannie yep. Willis in Georgia trying to take away her power. Wisconsin, where they tried to like limit the power of the incoming Democratic governor. I mean, like these guys are going all out. And I feel like the warnings that the rest of us have done, it's like many of our colleagues. I don't know if I've used this analogy before. I always joke that if the fascists take over, they're going to put all of us, by the way, you, you included, because you're a bad white. That's what fascists don't really like. Fascists go after everyone. Like look at Liz Cheney, where is she at right now, if you don't believe me. When we're, when we're all in the camps, the rest of us, you, me, the other folks, your listeners, we're going to be like, it's going to be like Steve McQueen from The Great Escape. Like, all right, all right, Pete, you get on the bike uh, and I'm going to send the pigeons. Our friends who are white journalists, they're going to be trying to get the scoop from the prison guards. Hey, hey, when are they going to kill us? Can we get the scoop? And the prison guard is like, uh, we're going to shoot you in the head tomorrow. Can I get the exclusive? Like they still won't learn in the camps. <laughs> It's still the the point you're making is it doesn't matter how far it gets there. They're, they still won't see what you are have been uh, screaming. They're trying from the to kill these journalists. CNN had a target on it. And CNN is like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to kiss up to Republicans. The same people that want to kill us. What do you think of Brett Bayer and the new reporting on what he was doing? Basically saying we, we, we're, we might have to turn these results around because we're losing our audience. As others had been saying, but it seemed like it was different when it was him. Did you did you follow that? Well, yeah, yeah, all the text. So you're talking about this ongoing explosive, yes. amazing case. Yes, uh, I can't look away voting. from it. Although I don't yeah. think anything happens, anything changes legally. But I, I just think that there. No, you have to keep the focus on it. You have to keep the. Focus. I, I want to make huge sure huge. that that at least with my show, with my audience, and and that other people are the same. We have kind of a credibility test for what. You know, a journalist is able to get away with uh, certainly at some big corporate media company. Go ahead. Well, I, I don't even call him Fox News. And I think every listener of the Pete Dominic show, look, this is how you built up the momentum with the majority. We have the numbers. Why do we give credibility to Fox? The only way Fox can sustain itself, honestly, is not through its base, but by presenting itself as a legitimate news company. It needs the majority's buy in. Without the majority, it cannot Trojan horse and infiltrate its talking points to the rest of us, right? If you close it off, Pete, if you quarantine it, what do they have? They get choked off from the majority. They have their nutty base. They don't have influence with their base because the base is the minority. So why do our peers call it Fox News? Why do we give it legitimacy? Why do we coddle it, especially with this Dominion case through the discovery process? We found out Brett Meyer and all these other people knew that they were lying. Yeah accelerated the lie, platform these nuts like Cindy Powell. I didn't use those words. The crazy train, that was the words used by Laura Ingram and uh, uh, Tucker. Yep. Rupert Murdoch, the most dangerous man in America, one of the top five villains of the 21st century, admits that he could have stopped, but he didn't. And I'm glad you mentioned it. The reason why they didn't stop is they said, oh, the base will go to Newsmax and One American News Network. So we got to double down. And now to pivot away from that huge blockbuster news that's still ongoing, Dominion might win, folks. And it might win punitive damages. This is going to be very punishing for Fox. But bad guys usually win. Let's see. What happened? Instead of talking about it, 
Now we're all talking about January 6th. Bait and switch. That's why they did it. That's why it dropped on Monday. Right, 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 right. Well, listen, I hope you have a good time in Austin. And what what should do, what would you like folks that care about you to do while you're there to, to keep you uh, happy and not missing your family? We I've got a lot of we got a lot of Austin listeners. Can somebody want a home cooked meal? What do you need? A massage? No, I'm good. Uh, if you see me roaming down the street, say hello. Uh, give me recommendations to eat. I'll be just working, working, working. But hopefully in the last few nights, you know, we get to go to some of these concerts. Uh, last year, we got to see Beck. We saw Dolly Parton. It was great, man. I got into a mosh pit for the first time in years. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, it was fun. And they're like, they're like, wow, just moshing. Wow. I'm like, you don't know me. And then afterwards, someone <laughs> said, that's going to hurt, bro. I'm like, I did well. And man. I hope you're. Mo- I hope you're masked up in the mosh pit. Oh yeah, I was the only one masked up, so I didn't get COVID. But the other person got COVID. Oh no! And then they were like, their spouse was like, "Why don't you mask up like Waj?" And like I was stupid, so I was the only person masked up. I didn't get any COVID. If you see Waj in Austin, don't call him Hassan Minaj. Yeah, Hassan Hassan called uh, called me out on Daily Show. Yeah, I saw that. What did he say? He's like, uh, Made- he, he got off Twitter. And he's like, he used three examples of people to each much. So one was George Takei. One was that uh, right wing nut, uh, Mike Cernovich. And then he's like, Waj, he's my friend. But Waj has tweeted 172,000 times. Waj, look up. Your family misses you. And then, <laughs> it's awesome. And then, That's and then, awesome. And then I'm well, like, well, now I've got to get to 200,000. Half those were about the, the uh, <laughs> NBA. So. Yeah. Half, no, actually, most of those were when I was co-hosting AJM the stream and they had like no they had like no budget and I had to tweet out everything. That's hilarious that he did that. Good for him. Good for you. Have a great time. Thank you very much for joining me. I really, really appreciate you. And uh, let's talk soon. I hope. And I'll tell Mary, who am I telling? Mary has to talk. Mary, to Mary, Mary, Hassan and Mary Trump are two people. I would love to. Mary and I know each other just through, you know, but we never, we never met in person. I, I'm a huge fan of both of them. So All yeah. right, Mary and Mary, I'll make it happen. Thanks, man. You're the best. All right. right. Later. All right. There he goes. Wajahat Ali, everybody. And that is all I've got for you today. I think I'm going to take tomorrow and Monday off to get some space in my brain and reconnect with my wife and family and just chart the way ahead. I'm, I'm really... I need a couple days, if you don't mind. So if I don't post anything tomorrow or Monday, you know uh, I'm okay. And I'm just in the woods, as I like to say, because I'm literally, I'm probably literally in the woods. But I do hope to see you tonight at the Hangout. I very much look forward to that. It fills my cup every week, as I know it does many of you. So I hope to see you there. The link is in the email if you're a subscriber. So check that out. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. You guys are the greatest. I love the stand-up community, and I can't wait to see you tonight. See you then. Talk to you then. Bye-bye. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know what's right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep sitting tight. We got to open up the windows and let the world in. Now we got to get out of here and let the world in. Now we got to get out of here and let the world in. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw the land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even sent.
They knew that change was going to come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear and all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no one and try Rise up Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up Stand oh, up Oh, got to stand up Oh, come on Just stand up Everybody got to stand up In the darkest hour Stand up People got the power Stand up Come on, come on, come on Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, stay.